right, so welcome everyone. My name is Jenren Wetzler and I'm the Director of Learning and Training at Creative Commons. And Creative Commons, for those of you who are new to, to us, um, we are a nonprofit and we work towards equitable sharing of knowledge and culture for everyone everywhere in the public interest. We've built and now steward the licenses that power millions of people's unfettered access to research, information, education, and culture. And to date, we know of over 2 billion CC licenses being used across 9 million websites. While so much of our past work has focused on academics, governments, artists, and the cultural heritage sector, we're particularly thrilled to explore new collaborations with journalists. Journalism is at the forefront of all of our current most dire challenges, shining spotlights on corruptions of power, climate change, the pandemic, refugee crises, and more. And it's a form of public service critical to all of us. So now more than ever, we need to support journalists in their efforts to provide verified information, investigate our shared challenges, and bring essential health facts to all of us. Stronger support for journalists enables a healthier information ecosystem. It provides our global shared commons of knowledge and culture more support. So while Creative Commons doesn't have the answers to the systemic challenges that journalists face, we are hosting this series to learn from you and offer what support we can. And as described in our kickoff webinar last week, we conducted surveys and focus groups with over 500 journalists from 18 countries across four continents to better understand the current challenges that journalists face. So this webinar series started with a bird's eye view of our current digital landscape for journalists. And today we begin the first of our deep dive conversations. These conversations will explore challenges as well as working models for information sharing drawing from the ideals of an open internet, using open source platforms, applying crowdsourcing techniques, and using CC licensed content to ensure the biggest possible audiences can access critical information. The arc of the conversation will culminate in our free online training, where CC staff will address some of the learning needs journalists identified in our research, from a copyright basics class to offering the practical tips and concrete tools needed to find openly licensed, freely usable images, video, and audio for stories. So today's deep dive conversation explores the Wikimedia Foundation's unique community-led <coughs> approach to understanding and addressing misinformation and disinformation on Wikipedia. One of the biggest challenges that journalists noted in our research was around misinformation and disinformation campaigns. Other challenges related to declining audience trust and closures to local news. And I recently read that journalism, journalism needs a new theory of change. Daryl Holliday from the Columbia Journalism Review notes, free press framed as a public good should be measured by the ability of people to engage in the ongoing processes for positive change in their communities. And the best way for that vehicle to be that vehicle of positive change is to be getting more people involved and at a level in which everyone is willing to participate. I was really struck by that because that's what Wikipedia does. And the Wikimedia Foundation also builds trust among communities around the world with transparent practices, showing sources and evidence behind every story, behind every page. Transparency is built into the DNA on Wikipedia. So today I'm very excited that we get to learn more about uh, the Wikimedia process and the challenges that Wikipedia is still faced um, with misinformation and disinformation campaigns. So I'd now like to introduce Kate Levin, our first speaker, but want to invite you all to engage in these discussions. So please, as we're, as we're talking, feel free to share your thoughts and your questions, and we'll, we'll turn to questions after both speakers have a chance to, to share a bit. Okay, Kate Levin lives in Dublin, but is originally from the UK. She loves kayaking and skiing and is currently learning to rock climb despite being afraid of heights, which I love. Kate works on the Wikimedia Foundation's disinformation team, which sits under the umbrella of trust and safety at the foundation. In her work, she focuses on the Arabic community and Kate is fluent in Arabic and French. Kate previously worked as a disinformation analyst focused on researching disinformation trends on social media platforms. Prior to that, Kate worked on countering violent extremism online, specializing in tracking violent extremist networks on social media. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, okay, I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. We'll see how this goes. Oh, 
Okay, can everyone see the screen? Somewhat? Yes. There we go. Um, so it is great to be here and I'm really excited to share a little bit of an insight into how the WMF or the Wikimedia Foundation approaches disinformation issues. And I'm going to speak from the perspective of trust and safety. Um, and I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to try really hard to do this in 10 minutes, but we'll see what happens. So a quick introduction, uh, the WMF operates Wikipedia and other Wikimedia platforms. Um, the disinformation team, which is my team, sits under the umbrella of trust and safety. So everything that we do has to sort of fit into the general trust and safety philosophy and way of doing things. Um, I'm going to speak today about how disinformation manifests itself in different ways on different platforms. And I'm going to speak about why I think that a one size fits all approach to this information doesn't necessarily work that well. Um, can you all see the right hand side of the slide or are your faces in the way? Because they are on mine. There we go. I think we can see the whole, <clears throat> okay. the whole slide, <clears throat> I believe. It goes to action. Yeah, so action. Uh, finally, I'm going to speak a bit about why we use a community led approach and why we focus on behavior rather than content. So I'll speak quickly about the Wikimedia ethos in general, because that does a big part of um, it shapes a lot of the way in which we deal with disinformation in general. Uh, this is a quote from Jimmy Wales. He's the founder of Wikipedia. He says, imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. That's what we're doing. Um, so free knowledge is a really big, important concept within the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, but when we speak about free access, we don't just mean that you don't have to pay for it. We mean that everyone should have access to knowledge that is free from social, legal, or technological restrictions, free from influence by powerful actors, and as much as is possible, free from bias. And this also means that as much as is possible, we try to stop the Wikimedia Foundation itself from also influencing the content on Wikipedia. So this concept of free knowledge is one reason why we use Creative Commons licensing, because it ensures that the content is free and can be reused and distributed widely. Uh, but it also shapes a lot of the ways in which we interact with the community and with the content itself. So these are some of the ways in which free knowledge impacts how we interact with the community. We try as much as is possible to maintain community autonomy. We actually follow content guidelines that are written by the community. Um, within trust and safety, we focus on behavior rather than content. And this is because in general, the WMF has a hands-off or non-interference approach with the content itself. Um, and so that means that WMF staff do not change or remove content unless we are legally compelled to do so. Uh, and finally, the WMF is the last resort in any conflict issues. So we try as much as is possible to make sure that conflicts are resolved within the community before people come to us. So what does it mean to be community first? Um, we believe in an approach that puts the community in the driving seat. The community is always involved in policy writing and guiding the principles of the movement as a whole. They maintain near complete control over the content on Wikipedia. I say near complete because again, if we're legally compelled to remove something, then we do. Um, and they also write the content guidelines, which include the standards for reliability of content. This is the general structure of most Wikimedia communities. It might look a little bit different to this on some, some spheres, but mostly you have the main branch is the editors. So obviously we know there are tens of thousands of Wikipedia editors all over the globe who volunteer their time to write articles, check grammar, check punctuation, do patrolling and check for vandalism. Uh, the next branch are the bureaucrats. These are people who are elected by the communities to fulfill roles with advanced powers. Um, these would be administrators, check users, and at the top you have stewards who oversee the whole community. The next branch are the committees. These are also people who are elected by the communities. And uh, so you have, for example, the arbitration committee who deal with conflicts between users. And you have the Ombuds Commission who deal with privacy issues. And then finally, the last branch is the WMF. So the foundation provides an additional layer of protection outside of community governance, but we try as much as is possible to respect the autonomy of the community. So disinformation, how does that fit in with this? 
these are some of the questions that I think everyone who works on disinformation should ask themselves before even beginning to think about disinformation. So firstly, everyone knows knowledge is power. So who gets to have the power to decide what is true and what's false? Secondly, if disinformation is false information, how do we decide what the truth is? And if we say that we're gonna trust reliable sources to tell us what the truth is, then what's a reliable source? And finally, how do we ensure that information is reliable without engaging in bias or censorship? So I think most people are probably uh, familiar with the distinction between misinformation and disinformation, but just in case, misinformation is false information or misleading information that is shared regardless of intention to mislead, and disinformation is purposefully misleading information that is sold with it, that is shared with a definite intent to mislead. How is this different on Wikipedia platforms? Uh, there are many reasons why disinformation presents itself differently on Wikimedia platforms, as opposed to, for example, social media platforms. So firstly, the community, they lead the way in every aspect of the work. They do 99% of the work on uh, tackling disinformation. And they have a vested interest in stopping disinformation from manifesting on their platforms. This is because Wikipedia editors volunteer their own time and they really care about the project. They care that they are creating an encyclopedia that can be accessed for free by anyone in the world. So they don't want it to be used by disinformation actors. Secondly, the platform itself is a completely different environment to what you would see in some social media platforms. So rather than having thousands of opinions on a single topic like you would see in Twitter, you know, you have a constant news feed of, of different thoughts on the same issue. On Wikipedia, um, you have this aim to create one page per topic that is built through a community consensus. So people vote on the content, they vote on whether users are acting inappropriately. Um, and all of this is built on the best verifiable sources. Three, uh, the methods that are used are quite different sometimes because of this different environment. So on Twitter, you see a lot of things like bot accounts who spam like spam messages about a certain topic to try and overwhelm the community's conversations around a certain issue. We don't see as much of that, obviously, because we don't have this constant feed of information on Wikipedia. Um, what we do see are more often manual methods of spreading this information. Uh, uh, things like coordinating, lots of users coordinating together to try and sway voting processes, um, maybe trying to protect pages that they put disinformation onto, trying to block users who have stopped them from spreading disinformation, things like that. Um, and fourth, there are strict guidelines on Wikipedia around what you can and can't write, and I'll speak a bit more about those later. I'm going to skip past these because I don't think we'll have time. Um, so how does the Wikimedia community approach tackling disinformation? In general, the Wikimedia community doesn't speak about truth and false falsehoods. They speak about verifiability, neutral point of view, and no original research. These are the three key guidelines that most communities use to make sure that their content is reliable. Not all communities in the Wikimedia landscape have all three of these, but most of them do. Uh, so verifiability means that other people using the encyclopedia can check that this information has come from a reliable source. Neutral point of view means that uh, each page represents fairly proportionally and as far as possible without editorial bias, all the significant views that have been published by reliable sources on a topic. And no original research basically means that you can't go and write your own theories about a topic on Wikipedia. Everything that you put there has to have reliable sources to back it up. So what is a reliable source according to Wikipedia? Wikipedia's rules on verifiability state that questionable sources, circular sources, or self-published sources shouldn't be used. So a self-published source, I think, is fairly self-explanatory. A circular source is a source that quotes the Wikipedia page as its source. So the source quotes Wikipedia, and Wikipedia quotes the source, but there's no external origin of this information. Um, and questionable sources are defined as those that have a poor reputation for checking facts, that lack meaningful editorial oversight, or that have an apparent conflict of interest. What's the WMF approach then? So in the WMF, I will start in the center. 
we look at behavior over content. This means that we assess whether there is a clear pattern of behavior from a particular account or a group of accounts that shows an intent to mislead around a particular topic. And one of the measures that we use to think about this is whether there's a power imbalance. So have these users created an imbalance of power between the disinformation spreaders and good faith users? Uh, one thing might be that admins or stewards are abusing their power. Another thing might be that groups of editors are working together to sway votes. It might be that a user is using sock puppet accounts to sway votes again, or in serious cases, uh, editors might use violence or state pressure to keep others silent and to influence the content. So one of the kind of grounding fundamental philosophies that we use is the idea of community integrity. So the idea behind this is that if we protect good faith users and try to diminish the powers of bad faith users, then this in turn will protect the content. So things that we do for this are we offer training sessions to help community members to identify disinformation. We provide extra resources for the community, particularly around elections. We try to provide as many resources as possible for the community. Um, and we conduct investigations in serious cases. So this could mean that we would end up banning users who engage in particularly egregious behaviors. These are some of the most common behaviors that we see. So sock puppetry and uh, using biased or unreliable sources, uh, inserting false claims without sources, using language that denies or questions verifiable facts, blocking users with no reason, uh, undisclosed paid editing, and false claims of rule violations and project capture. Project capture is something that is particular to Wikipedia and the Wikimedia platforms. It means that a small group of users has managed to completely take over an entire project. So by project, I mean like it could be a language project on Wikipedia, it could be Wikipedia Hindi or Wikipedia French, or it could be uh, one of the platforms, so Wikimedia Commons. And it would mean that this small group has taken complete control and they, you know, write all the narratives. It's very rare, but it has happened. So previous examples on Wikipedia, I think I'm probably already running over time a bit, so I'll just do one. Um, this was a case of disinformation um, that was spread around Biden's election campaign. What happened was that a user impersonated a leading member of Joe Biden's campaign staff by using their account name as his name. And this user then went and edited the Wikipedia page for Senator Tammy Duckworth. The interesting thing about this case was that they didn't actually insert any false information onto Wikipedia. They just did small grammatical edits. But then what they did was they screenshotted this and they created a Twitter account and then tweeted about this, about this member of Joe Biden's campaign staff editing Wikipedia. And they claimed that this must mean that um, Senator Duckworth is a serious candidate for vice president, which was not the case at the time. <laughs> um, so this was an interesting case for us because it completely flew under the community's radar um, because they, they didn't vandalize the page. They didn't do anything that would be picked up by our um, brilliant communities. Um, and the actual misinformation took place on a different platform. So we found out because Joe Biden's campaign staff actually got in touch with us and told us about the problem. And we blocked the account for impersonating a member of Joe Biden's campaign staff. Um, this is a case of project capture. I'm not going to speak about it because I'm already over time. Um, but if you are interested, there are public reports published by the WMF about both of these issues, the Biden issue and the Croatian Wikipedia issue. And they're available on uh, meta.wikimedia.org. So you can search for those there. Or I can drop links in the chat if anyone's particularly interested. Um, and I'll stop talking there. So I'm sorry, I've gone over time, but <laughs> anyway. oh, that's fine. Thank you so, so much for sharing the um, the campaigns. And I think, yeah, the, the links to the Croatian case would be very appreciated. Um, also, the, the level of sophistication in the um, misinformation or the, the kind of infiltration for the Biden campaign was really remarkable and also terrifying. So yeah. thank you for having yeah. that. Um, all right, looking forward to folks' questions in the chat um, about either of those campaigns or also other things that Kate mentioned. But in the meantime, <clears throat> I'd like to now introduce Diego Saez Trumper, who was born and raised in Chile, 
Diego also has lived in Brazil, Qatar, and the UK. He currently lives in Spain, but is joining us from Brazil. Diego is a senior research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation, where he conducts research to support the Wikimedia movement, trying to help apply the best possible tools that the massive data analysis techniques can provide. Prior to Wikimedia, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Yahoo Labs and a research scientist at Euracat, a data scientist at NTNT, -E and a part-time lecturer at UFP. He has a degree in acoustic engineering, a PhD in information technology from the Universidad Pompeu Fabra, and his research includes, well, they include a lot, I will just name a couple, um, online disinformation, innovation, influence in online social networks, free knowledge, algorithms on graphs, um, and privacy issues. And a fun fact, Diego is in a band called Balacumbia, which is played in 16 countries and recorded two albums, and is now running a crowdfunding campaign to record the third one, which I'm very much looking forward to after listening to a little of the music. So feel free to post a link if, uh, if you have one. All right, Diego, over to you. Now, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you also Kate for the great presentation. Let me share my screen. Um, so here and here. Can you see my screen? It's loading now. Yes, it's loading. Okay, now. Yep, we see it now. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Uh, for me, I, I'm a big fan of Creative Commons, so for me, it's an honor to be here today. And uh, today I want to do a complementary uh, presentation of what Kate did. And I will talk about what we do at the research team on the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, the, in the, the research team in the Wikimedia Foundation is a very small team. We are eight uh, people working there. It's mainly we are we are coming from the computer science, artificial intelligence, data science uh, field, and at the team we have uh, basically two lines of research. One is about knowledge gaps, so where we study gaps and content in the, across different projects, and we try to create uh, machine learning tools or machine learning assistive tools that can help on that. And we also have this other line of research uh, where mainly uh, Pablo Aragon that is here and me, we're working that we call uh, knowledge integrity. Uh, one important thing, so I have mentioned that we come from this computer science background and that we do artificial intelligence, machine learning. But one thing that is very important for us in any conference, in any presentation that we do and in our daily work is that we have a human-centered approach. That means that we don't want to build uh, artificial intelligence agents that will solve the problems uh, in the Wikimedia space about knowledge integrity and about uh, the problem with information in this case, but to build tools that would support uh, the community to monitor and fix uh, violation of the, con uh, the content policies. The most important were already mentioned by, by Kate. So in, in a nutshell, we use uh, machine learning and data science to assist our community and to provide tools to, to them. I will jump the core content policies that uh, Kate already mentioned. Um, and I want just to uh, add a few things about what we see as this information in Wikipedia and, and basically why this is very different from the issues that other platforms faces uh, because first of all, one main difference between Wikipedia and uh, social media like Twitter, Facebook, or any other uh, of these uh, social uh, media platforms is that while in your account, in your social, uh, in your preferred social network is about sharing your opinions, uh, Wikipedia is about uh, sharing knowledge. Uh, the main difference from the perspective of the people that trains algorithms on this is that we don't have a single source for ground truth. As, as Kate already mentioned, we don't have uh, a central repository or, or, and we don't work with this idea of truth. We work more with this idea of that the content comes from reliable sources and that you can verify that content. And 
and this is this is central when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, because basically when when you train an algorithm to and, and what many of these commercial platforms do, it's you need to have the truth somewhere, and what your algorithm will do is you will have a claim and you will have the truth somewhere. And this and, and your algorithm basically will try to learn how to match this piece of text or this piece of content against this truth that already exists. In our case, we don't have that. Most of the big platforms nowadays uses Wikipedia as their ground truth. So if you go to any conference about uh, disinformation or about uh, natural language processing to understand uh, content reliability, what they will do is take any piece of content and compare with Wikipedia as Wikipedia uh, <laughs> supposed to be to be truth. It's not that we recommend or we don't recommend that. It's what is, in fact, it's happening nowadays. So this, this is for us a central difference. We have uh, this blog post that you see on, on the slide if you want to read more about uh, our reflections around that. And the other main uh, difference between uh, social networks and Wikipedia is that uh, the content it's in your in your social network is your content basically you are publishing it's your it's your statement at the end and in the case of wikipedia the the final product that are the articles are community owned so there's no one that is the owner of one article uh, so this is like the big umbrella where uh, we work under and now what i want to do is basically show you some of the projects that uh, we are working on or some of projects that we have already finished to give you a, an idea of which kind of things we do at the research team. So for example, uh, one thing that we did uh, and we published uh, last year with uh, some uh, interns and collaborators with, in this case, Kay Wong, that was an uh, outreach intern, brilliant, that we had from uh, from from outreach, that is this. Uh, I, I don't know if you know that that initiative, but it's a initiative to find uh, interns that will work in in, in the space of uh, in in our case in the space of technology. So we publish uh, this weekly reliability data set where we use community annotated um, articles uh, to understand problems of content reliability. So instead of what most of uh, commercial platforms are doing that they consider that all Wikipedia is the same and they consider this as a ground truth. What we did here was to take the full, uh, in, this, in this publication, the full English Wikipedia, now we have extended this to uh, more than 10 languages, is to use what the community used to signal when you have problems uh, in this game, content reliability issues with articles and, uh, and to transform this in a matching readable content. So the community of um, natural language uh, processing uh, researchers or the community that is working on automatic assessment of this information, they can learn from good quality Wikipedia pages and, and understand that not uh, all of them are the, are the same. And this is basically, I, I show this example because this shows you if you understand how Wikipedia works, you can really use that for in, for training your algorithms. It's not. It's not that we are saying that you shouldn't use Wikipedia for training your algorithms. It's as lar one of the largest um, data sources for training algorithms. But if you understand that, for example, community use these templates. That is this example that you see here to show when there's a, a content issue. You train a better uh, algorithm, basically. Uh, another thing that we have done uh, this week, an um, intern that was coming from, from Ukraine with Mikola, that it's from the Catholic University of Ukraine, we, we showed the limits of using automatic fact checking using Wikipedia. So basically, we, we installed, uh, we created uh, an algorithm that used uh, the state of art techniques for automatic fact checking. And, to, and we create an open API that anyone can use to. Uh, send a claim and use Wikipedia as a ground truth and see what Wikipedia is saying about that specific claim. Again, this is very far from perfect. And our main intention, because basically here we are reproducing state-of-the-art research, we are not contributing with new ways of using uh, automatic fact-checking, but having an open API would help you first that you can reproduce that, the code, it's, it's public and you for sure can reuse it. 
or as a final user, you can test it and you can see what are the limits of automatic fact checking. There's this hype about using uh, and this idea that artificial intelligence will solve the problem of this information. And there's a lot of people that think like that. There's a lot of companies that think like that. And if you test this, you will see that in fact helps in many in many cases, but also shows you all the cases where this is, is not working. Another very interesting project that we have been working, and this was a project led by my colleague uh, Miriam Reddy, uh, was uh, what we call the Citation Detective. Citation Detective is basically an algorithm that helps the community to find sentences that doesn't have a citation. So basically you can think on this if you're familiar with this citation needed, that is what the community adds manually when you have a statement that's supposed to have a, a, a source and it's not and the source is not there. So this citation needed nowadays is added manually. What we did was to build an algorithm that will help you to find that, uh, uh, that kind of um, sentences. So instead of the users need to read the full article, the editors to read the full article to find sentences that doesn't have the citation, we show you the ones that are more likely to have that problem. And again, this is always human mediated. It's not that we build a bot that annotates a lot of sentences with citation needed. We build a tool that is used by the community to find, to, to audit basically these uh, articles. This is some, some examples of what we, we have been doing. Uh, this, those tools are available, the citation detective, you can find it in, in, in this link here and the, you have the links to the other papers. And I also want to show some of the things that there were currently doing. Uh, one thing that we are doing now, we just submitted a paper and, and we will release a data set also about this is trying to use this citation detective uh, to understand the citation coverage. So to understand which percentage of the sentences that needs a citation now really have that, the source there. And we are studying the evolution of this over time in, in this plot, what you see basically is how this has been improving in, uh, in articles about biographies, so biographies in Wikipedia, how this has been improving in the last, in the last 10 years. And we see that the community is uh, doing a good work, but we are still uh, far away from having all the references that we would like to have in Wikipedia. Another thing that we are trying to understand is uh, what we call knowledge propagation. So across projects, when we refer to projects in the in the Wikimedia space, uh, we, uh, we we refer to different communities. So for example, the English Wikipedia for us is is one project. The Spanish Wikipedia is another project, and Wikidata is another project. So one thing that we would like to or that that we are trying to to investigate and to have a more insights about how this is happening is how the creation of content in one language affects other languages. So if you want to influence what is happening in English Wikipedia, but English Wikipedia is uh, not easy to introduce this information there because there's a lot of eyes looking to there, how likely is if I create and I add some disinformation in the Spanish Wikipedia or in the Portuguese Wikipedia or in the Japanese Wikipedia, how likely this is to affect other languages. And it's not only how this will affect English, but how this will affect also other uh, smaller projects. This is a collaboration that, that we are doing with colleagues here from, from Brazil and also from, from Barcelona. Another project uh, that my colleague Pablo Aragon is leading is what we call the Knowledge Integrity Risk Observatory. So basically one problem that we have, and we haven't mentioned this uh, a lot, but is that depending on the size of uh, the community in each project, it's, it's more difficult to early spot and track uh, issues when they are happening. Because sometimes we have even projects that we don't have anyone in the, in the Wikimedia Foundation that speaks the, that, that, that language. So if you, you have a problem in a Wikipedia where you cannot do this kind of uh, qualitative analysis, it's good to have some metrics that allow us to detect that something unusual at least is happening in, in one language. So what Pablo is, is doing now is basically try to create different kind of metrics. And these metrics are very diverse, includes the number of editors per article, the number of sections, the number of uh, references, 
uh, that you have in average per article, for example, or, or, or this, all these problems of uh, unbalance of power that Kate was mentioning to have this across uh, all the 300, uh, more than 300 uh, language editions that, that we have uh, in Wikipedia. Uh, so this, we are doing more, more than this, but given that uh, in 10 minutes, there's not, I, ca I cannot talk in detail of, for all of them. I hope that this gives you an, a general idea of what, what we are doing. And it's very important also to say that uh, we are super interested in, in collaborate with people. One thing that we do a lot in the research team, and I think you saw this across the projects that I show, is to collaborate with different kinds of institutions, universities, uh, the outreach program that I already mentioned, uh, having interns, and also we have this format collaboration program that we do with mainly with universities, but also with research labs in, in, in um, other organizations, could be companies, could be NGOs that are interested on, on the field. And we have a wide set of, uh, of, of collaborations from people that comes more from the computer science, but also for us, it's very interesting to interact with journalists, with lawyers, that people that can help us add, add some expertise um, that would be helpful to uh, address different problems of this information and to improve the kind of tools that basically we can build to support uh, our community. So if you are interested in collaborating with us, please uh, send me an email and I'll be super happy to, to talk with you and to see if we can find um, a space for, for collaborating. And yeah, that, that's all that I have for today. Thank you so much. It's fascinating to kind of, I, I guess, peel back the curtain and see what's going on at Wikimedia to address some of these challenges and to really to, to apply these transparent principles in, in every step of the way. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that and also for the, the call for collaboration. I will note next um, our next webinar um, will actually look at some research that I think the um, the Center for Internet and Society did on um, representation of language groups. And I think they're going to target Wikipedia as well as um, maybe Google Maps. So hope you all can join that as well. OK, so now we have time for questions. I'd love to, to hear more questions from the audience. I know we have a couple that have come in so far. Um, the first question is for Kate. Um, Jennifer asks, I'd be interested to learn if there's a way to address Wikipedia content being used in metadata on other sites to drive traffic to misleading content. So that was, I think, one thing that um, came up with the Biden misinformation um, case. The content is loosely cited, such as just listing from Wikipedia. I don't know if you have any other comments on that, Kate. <clears throat> And I see you've, you've written something back in the chat. So for the sake of the recording, I'll just read it live. Um, Kate noted, um, this is a tricky problem for us. In general, it's difficult for us to influence what happens on other sites unless, they're direct, unless they directly infringe on Wikimedia trademarks or there are community members engaged in behavior that does go against the terms of use while they're representing a community, there's often little we can do. I'm not sure if Diego has anything to add to this. Diego? Yeah, no, very shortly. We have a project also in the research team that is led by Isaac Johnson or other of the researchers in the team that is about the reusage of, uh, of Wikipedia, of Wikimedia in general information. We're trying to, and, and there we were partnership with uh, DuckDuckGo uh, to understand, for example, how the, the um, usage of, um, uh, the usage of Wikipedia content in search engines is affecting we are aware that especially information that is in Wikidata, and we haven't talked here about Wikidata, but Wikidata is the knowledge base that is behind Wikipedia. Uh, we know that this is used a lot by uh, others, uh, especially big companies, Google Search, uh, Amazon Alexa, all the things you, we know that they use. It's difficult to access because we, we give the knowledge for free, the community creates this knowledge for free, then they use uh, these under uh, proprietary software, so we don't know exactly how they use it, but uh, we're trying to measure that somehow, and we, we have a project on that, still with not, not a lot of uh, insights to share, but it's something that we're working on. 
Thank you. And I know Jonathan Poritz had a kind of a question slash challenge to the Wikimedia approach to devaluing self-published sources. Um, Jonathan, I don't know if you're available to ask a question about this live. Otherwise, I'm I'm happy to circle back to you. All right. And it sounds like, yeah, Jonathan's audio is not very good right now, so no problem. I will just read the, the comment because I think it's a particularly interesting one. Um, <clears throat> he noted, interesting that Wikimedia Foundation devalues self-published sources, which seems to imply that publisher published sources are viewed as having better reliability. There's something about that which makes me nervous. For example, in scholarly publishing, it seems that commercially published journals have little interest other than making money, which sometimes means they optimize for quality of content, but that's mostly by accident, in my humble opinion. So the <clears throat> sorry, so the informal arxiv.org preprint server is in many ways better than formally published articles, again, in my humble opinion. I don't know if either of you have any comments on that about um, not valuing the self-publishing as much as go ahead well i have a comment of course because i run a couple of repositories of scientific content and uh, it, it, it's definitely that you, you need to have some kind of measured approach for it. there are people with a very high reputation with very good track record who are publishing stuff uh, obviously even by themselves and uh, it's okay but there are people who there is you know a whole industry of scam uh, scientific Oh, I just lost your audio, actually. I, I lost you at, there's a whole industry of scam scientific. Yeah, we can't, we can't hear. And it sounded like a really important point. To uh, actually uh, differentiate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if anybody else had difficulty hearing, the audio cut out for me. Um, after you were talking about the the industry, um, Ellen, do you mind um, asking your question one more time? I'm so sorry. I think it it cut out. Uh, can you hear me now? Is it good? Yeah. Um, I, my my question was how do, there is a problem because we um, I'm coming from Russia. We have a lot of scams in scientific journals. So because of the way the results are measured in academic institutions, people are overstimulated to publish it. And there, there are so many uh, journals that are pretending to be scientific and basically it's a paid for publication. Whereas uh, we also have a kind of hostile environment for environmental climate research and other stuff. So a lot of people tend to publish the articles themselves and it takes um, a lot of time to, uh, to, to get the article published. I will just give you one example. I had a very interesting uh, conflict before my eyes. When Facebook actually marked as uh, unreliable an article by Guardian, which, uh, which, which, which actually quoted the new results for methane measurement in the Arctic, which, is, which was very high, a lot of methane. But um, the people from some kind of obscure NGO that was doing proofreading and fighting disinformation, they uh, obliterated that article basically on Facebook by claiming that the new measurements, which are very high, contradict prior management measurements, which were lower, you know, so I mean, this, this is basically, is the, for example, in the States with this uh, high polarization and conflict between Republican conservatives and climate oriented Democrats, let's say, you know, people, for example, on Facebook would be prone to look for the sources that uh, actually uh, put down new climate information. And, uh, for example, by measuring against old information, which, which is better because we're getting, you know, to the crisis point, so everything's growing. All the things are kind of more and more. And they're putting them down, saying, look, this is not true because in the scientific published articles like three years ago, the, the, the numbers were different. So this article is unreliable. So how, how can you work on that? Thank you so much. That's a great point. Thanks. I posted one link that is somewhat related. I don't want to take up more time talking. I wanted to hear from, from Kate and Diego. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted, I was actually typing response to that and I fell out of the call for some reason and then we started talking about it anyway. So, um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but I was going to drop a link to the um, Wikipedia guidelines for reliable sources. And I just want to reiterate that these guidelines are written by the community, not by the WMF. So I can't tell you exactly why they chose to say that self-published sources aren't acceptable. I agree that it's not a perfect metric, you know, like some public, some um, sources that are published by reliable journals could end up being false. Some self-published sources are great. Um, it's not a perfect metric, but I assume that they had to come down on one side or the other of the issue. Um, and if actually, if you do disagree with Wikipedia guidelines, then you can click on the talk tab in that page and you can start a discussion about it with Wikipedia volunteers. You might get horrifically shot down, you never know, but it's always worth opening a discussion if you really feel something. There is actually already an ongoing discussion on that talk page about independent journalists and how their content should be handled. So it could be interesting to read for anyone who's really interested in that. Thank you so let much. Me, let me add, Please. let me add, I think this is a super interesting topic. Um, the, no, not to insist of what Kate said about this art community uh, design and rules, uh, but some of the reasons behind that is, I, th I think it was in, originally mainly referring to people uh, using their own blogs as a source, for example, that you cannot point to your own blog. But I think it's also important to remember this idea of we don't talk that much about what is truth or, or what is true or not, or what is the truth, um, but it's more about that you can verify the content. And, and basically the, the problem that you will create if you need to, if all the voices were with there and there was no previous peer review process, this is, would be a lot, no? So it would be very difficult to represent and to understand which are the most uh, reputable voices there. I think it's very important uh, what was mentioned about that articles can be, articles published in, in, in some sources could be sometimes not even false, but can be outdated. So this is a dynamic, uh, very dynamic environment. And uh, I put their link there of the, what uh, the English Wikimedia community called the uh, perennial sources. And basically what they do there is they try to evaluate source by source and they have a discussion about uh, the most some of the most used source in 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 uh, Wikipedia. So they go and they have discussion. For example, archive.org, uh, this pre-published stuff. It's uh, their tags uh, generally unreliable because it has not been reviewed. So I can go and just upload my paper there uh, without any re reviews. But there's a huge discussion of, uh, about uh, every source, and uh, and the community has this. Um, consensus process that finally, the same discussion that we are having here, they have been having this discussion for a long time and all the things are revisited time to time. So uh, I think it's important to understand that reliable source is not written stone. It's not, uh, this is not about belief. This is about how useful are the sources in a given uh, and a specific moment in time. And the community ha having humans discussing these uh, every i don't know every day probably it's it's the only way that uh, i think we can have to uh have at least represented in the wikipedia articles the most uh, relevant opinions about uh, every every topic it's we won't find the truth because if we will have a single truth uh, wikipedia will be not necessary <laughs> thank you so much and i just think some of the some of what you mentioned, these challenges are not particular to Wikipedia. We've we've always had these challenges in understanding the information at our disposal. We've always had um, had to kind of question sources and so on. It's just more readily and easily traceable now through such transparent practices. So um, anyway, I, I really appreciate this, the thoughtfulness and the willingness to engage with the, the community that Wikimedia offers. Let's see, Jonathan notes, that's interesting. In some scholarly disciplines, everything is first posted on ARXIV before eventually coming out in commercial journals. And Jennifer notes, another place where I see the push for secondary sources being problematic is with government documents. For example, if a governor issues an executive order and has a press conference and publishes a press 
release, in public policy, we would consider those the definite, wait, sorry, those the definitive statement of the government's action. Yet Wikipedia prefers to support that with a news article written by a journalist who attended the press conference. These articles are often written by inexperienced freelance journalists working under a lot of pressure. That does seem to be, yeah, a, a challenge. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm realizing we have about 10 minutes left of this webinar. I can't believe it. Um, I think some of the, the things that we're, we're discussing allude to the inherently political nature of, of some of the, the efforts to verify information. I mean, ideally it's, it's not political, but it does seem to be a, a pretty um, political move in some ways. I don't know if either of you have any, any thoughts on that or you know, any comments. Um, I can expand on the logic behind it a bit more if that helps. It generally fits into the idea of no original research. So I think the, the underlying idea is that if you are putting together um, primary sources and then drawing your own conclusions, that that would be your own thesis and it would kind of look like your own research, which is, I think, one of the reasons for the push towards secondary sources. But I think it's a really relevant point. Um, and again, yeah, like we said, all of these guidelines are up for debate. And if if it's something that you are interested in debating and having that conversation about, then you can go to Wikipedia and, and talk to the community about it. Thank you so much. And I see there's there's some back and forth discussion in the, the chat space as well. Thank you. And I, I know we have another Wikimedian in the audience here who's um, launching a, a website, a crowdsourcing website too. Matthias, I don't know if you had any any thoughts that you wanted to share. Not to yeah, put you on the spot. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I don't want to take much of the time because the discussion is very good and I'm enjoying it so far. Um, but uh, I'm wearing a different hat now, uh, not as a Wikimedian, but uh, as a volunteer uh, working in the Brazilian community that is trying to create a platform for independent journalists to uh, fact check and uh, have a proper workflow. Because right now it's kind of prohibitive for some independent journalists to have access to databases uh, or tooling that will help on the, the fact checking and doing it on uh, um, as rapid as possible because uh, this misinformation, disinformation is spread much faster than uh, the checking of it. So yeah, just I, I'd love to uh, sh I, to share the um, we are about to to launch and uh, uh, Jen heard me uh, talking about that before and the reason that it's so difficult to do that is because. Uh, uh, legal issues and uh, refining the process of fact checking because um, well, right now we have a, a group of uh, journalists trying to come up with a, a workflow where we have fact checking, we have cross facting like a peer review uh, uh, process for, for fact checking and we want to do that, that transparently in a way that everyone can uh, um, engage with it so it's very inspired, it's heavily inspired on Wikipedia actually. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a Brazilian effort right now, but uh, it's supposed to be something that can be, uh, I, I don't know, helpful for other communities. Thank you so much. And thanks for sharing the link. All right, I think we have time for maybe one last question or closing remarks from our speakers. Uh, does anyone in the audience have one last question that they wanna pose? All right, then I will turn it back over to Kate for uh, any closing remarks and then to Diego for any closing remarks. Um, I didn't actually prepare any closing remarks, um, but yeah, I just would love to encourage everyone to get involved in, in Wikipedia, get involved in the discussions. If you feel strongly about, you know, what kinds of sources should be used, you know, you are journalists, so who better than to be involved in these discussions. So please do get involved if you if you can. Thank you so much. And we're so glad that you both could join us today. Um, Diego? Hmm. 
and I'm not getting audio again. It might it might come back. I, I feel like the audio has been a little challenging today. No, still nothing. <laughs> hmm. Still nothing, huh, how strange. Um, but we want to thank you for, no, still, yeah, <laughs> still nothing. But you know what, at least it happened at the very end, which is, um, this is good. This is better than in the, the beginning. Um, maybe I'll, I'll loop back in just a second in case, in case it starts to work again. I see, um, Ivan, thank you for, for joining. Thank you all so much for attending this discussion and for your, your thoughtfulness here. It's really always fun to, to learn something, not just from speakers, but also from audiences and in, in discussions like these. So we really appreciate it. And we hope that you will- Can you see me now? Oh, yes, we can. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is because I'm using Chrome instead of Firefox, but no. Um, just want to sorry sorry uh, I I just want to uh, as a final remark emphasize on this idea of uh, that truth it's uh, it's a complex issue and maybe looking for truth is not the best answer to find this information the importance of uh, that you can verify who is saying what it will um, it will give you more possibility of create your own opinion about things the important thing is that we know who is saying what. And the other thing that I all, always like to emphasize a lot, and maybe this is against what, what I do or people can, can see like this, but don't wait that or don't expect that uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning will solve the problem of this information. And this is something that humans can fortunately cannot be replaced by machines. Machines could help us to find this information, to detect uh, misbehavior, to detect uh, the usage of other tools uh, or automated tools to deceive people, but uh, without communities discussing uh, what is happening, discussing the content, it would be impossible to, to solve this problem. So creating strong communities is the first and the most important part of finding this information, in, in my opinion, at least. What better remarks to end on? That I really appreciate especially coming from someone who deals with binary class classification. I think recognizing the non-binary nature of, of truth is, yeah, that's pretty powerful. Okay, thank you all so much. We're delighted that we could have this discussion today and we will create a, a recording link and share it um, as soon as we can. And hope to see you in our next webinar on February 8th um, from two to 3 p.m. UTC. Um, this will be language and narrative power focused. So risks with digital platforms, language and narrative okay. power. I do have to say it's a massive honor to be part of this. All the way from Ghana, Northern region. And then um, I enjoyed the conversation. But I um, wanted to say that here in Ghana, I work in the news space. We provide the news for our audience. And then we were having the discussion about authenticity, individual commercial publishers and all that. But I think that at the end of the day, for here in Ghana, to rely on these commercial entities, especially those that are not owned by individuals, but by well-established groups is the best because for the individuals here, you know, in academia is different, but in terms of news gathering, news publication and all that, it looks like because journalists are under-resourced, highly under-resourced, we are poor, we are poorly paid and all that. Politicians have found their way to recruit people who are professionals and, you know, to provide information that sort of sing praises of them. So usually when you have to rely on these people, particular people for information, you end up taking more exaggerated ones. So it is more reliable to have to concentrate on these commercial, you know, very viable, well-established media entities than to have to depend on individual for reliability, for fact-checking and all that. 
Thank you so much, Kungundu. And thank you for joining us all the way from Ghana. Um, it sounds like you and Jonathan might have some good discussions on the um, on the Wikipedia pages that allow for this kind of debate. So thank you Absolutely. for yeah for sharing kind of a, a I try to I try to come in, but I ran out of data and I had to go back and look for well to come back. Uh -huh. I wanted to make this point, but, but I'm so glad that's 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 all right. So thank, thank you. you. All right. And with that, we will end this webinar. Thank you all so much again and have a wonderful rest of your, your day or evening, wherever you are. We'll hope to see you again soon.